Oppenheimer is a massive success. As of August 6, 2023, which is the day that I'm actually recording this, Oppenheimer has managed to gross $527 million worldwide, making it the largest World War II movie in history. But as I kind of mentioned in my previous video, which was more of an analysis of the film and looking at what it did right and what it did wrong, there is some things that I wasn't able to really talk about because it really would not have fit with that video. This movie is the story of a man who changed the course of world history by shepherding the development of the first atomic bomb. But in making the story of the man who helped to make the bomb. There is actually a degree of controversy because the movie has left out some details about the people of the area that were affected. On the sidelines of all of this, there was a community that lived downwind from the testing site in the southern New Mexico desert. The impacts of this from the explosion from Trinity from the testing of nuclear weapons at this site has never really been something that has fully been embraced or accepted by the US government. The controversy that we're seeing with a movie like Oppenheimer isn't just, oh, is using nuclear weapons okay, was it morally wrong, or any number of the other questions that one would seek to answer in many clickbaity articles online or in comment sections of posts. But the thing that this movie really left out for all of its talk of geopolitics and morals and science is the real effects of the people that remained behind at Trinity once everything was said and done. Nuclear fallout is a very real thing, and after years of study in the year 2020, the National Cancer Institute said that some people probably got cancer from the radioactive fallout that wafted across New Mexico after the U.S. government detonated the first atomic bomb in 1945. However... To this day, we still don't have any exact science or number on this. Like the researchers here say that it's impossible to know with certainty if New Mexico's cancer rates ever really changed in the first decades after the test, given that there was a severe lack of comprehensive data over it. What they did conclude from the study, though, was that the blast and the effects of those born in the subsequent years would likely have been too small to expect any additional cases, that the ones that did occur were likely from the immediate effects after the testing. Which, for the people today that still live in the area, that's not an answer that is good enough. It is still something that to them they are continuously fighting for, and even as this movie was debuting, they were protesting. Now, of course, when we're talking about this right now, government scientists never discount the potential for fallout before moving ahead with the Trinity test. Though the thing, as I mentioned in the previous video that they seem to be concerned about in the movie, was whether or not it would set off a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world, not just create some fallout that might affect some people here and there. Here we have a detonation that changed the entire course of human history, something that ensured ensured the end of World War II and marked the dawn of the atomic age. But in the almost eight decades since then, some residents have continued to fight for recognition from the government, saying generations of people in the area have been affected by these tests in a way that we can't necessarily know. That is the controversy in America, at least, when talking about the movie with Oppenheimer. But it was over the course of doing the research for this in the previous video that I looked at this and thought, my God, that's right. The movie is not talking about fallout. It doesn't talk about any of the things that people expect. Experience. Some of the people of New Mexico suffer to this day, and I do not want to diminish their suffering in any way, shape, or form. I'm not going to do that. But when we are talking about the Trinity test, my friends, that is only the tip of the iceberg on this subject. As resources become more and more scarce across the world, one of the things that people have been talking about turning to more is nuclear energy, something that had experienced a golden age over the course of the 20th century, but then gradually over time in many places lost favor. The reason of which, in many cases, was highly publicized disasters that occurred. Everyone may be talking about Oppenheimer, but not nearly as many people are talking about the fallout of what Oppenheimer created. So today, I wanted to go ahead and tell you all my opinion on the worst nuclear disasters in history. Even though we were talking about the after effects of the fallout of Trinity, the first true nuclear disaster that we can be talking about here is going to be that that occurred at Kishtim. In the years following World War II, the Soviet Union had constructed dozens of covert facilities, many of them hastily and rather shoddily built. It kind of talks about this over the course of Oppenheimer, specifically where the Soviets were rapidly trying to create nuclear weapons in order to be able to catch up to the United States, and they did succeed. At least, sort of. The entire purpose of what they were doing was to strengthen their nuclear arsenal as much as possible, as quickly as possible, regardless of what they would need to do for safety efforts. And one of these, the first one that we're going to be talking about, was the Mayak nuclear fuel processing plant in the Russian town of Ozerosk. This is the place that would become the site of a major disaster when the cooling system in a waste storage tank would fail, causing the dried radioactive material inside of it to explode. And while the explosion at Trinity was definitely on purpose, this was something that was not, and the fallout of which was going to be so significantly worse. 
You see, in the late afternoon on the 29th of September, 1957, the residents of the Chelyabinsk district in the southern Urals noticed that there was an unusual bluish-violet color in the sky. The regional press that was talking about it at the time speculated that there were possibly polar lights, but in order for it to appear that far south, that was rather surprising and something that needed to be talked about. However, people started to realize that something must have gone wrong, or at least something big had happened, because all of a sudden, government activity started to occur all over the place especially at the highly classified military area that housed the nuclear facility of Maya. The peasants of the area were then required to slaughter their livestock, they were required to bury their crops, and then they were required to replow over their land. More than 20 different villages comprising something along the lines of 11,000 people were then forcibly removed without any information about why it is that they had to move in the first place. The villages were then subsequently immediately demolished to leave nothing there for other people to wander into. No official statement was ever given about any of these orders, but people could very quickly realize that, hey, something had to have occurred at Mayak that was causing all of this. There had to have been some kind of big accident. Also, before we move on, I should probably clarify, but I keep on saying Mayak incident rather than Kishtim, but the reason we refer to it as Kishtim incident is because Mayak technically didn't exist. It was a classified facility and wasn't on any maps, and so the name of the incident was named after the local community that was closest by, Kishtim. But now we should go ahead and provide a little bit of context. When we were talking about the facility that was actually known as Mayak, this was something that was established in 1946. And by 1949, it had managed to produce the first Soviet nuclear bomb. But of course, making just one bomb was never something that was going to be good enough for Papa Stalin and the Soviet Union, so naturally speaking, they had to make more. But not only was Moscow demanding that they make more bombs, they were demanding that they make them faster. More bombs, bigger, better, faster, everything. And amazingly enough, Mayak was actually able to deliver on this. But unfortunately, when you were able to increase the amount of things that you make in such a rapid rapid pace, this is something that oftentimes comes at a great cost. And in this case, this was a basic disregard of any kind of safety measures that you would normally have in a facility of this scope. Like, even before any kind of disaster actually occurred, something along the lines of 17,000 workers from 1948 to 1958 were going to receive overdoses of radiation. And that's just the workers. The dumping of radioactive waste into the nearby river between the periods of 1949 to 1952 would cause several outbreaks of radiation sicknesses in villages downstream. For the people who were living here at the time, it was just part and parcel of living near such a big facility. You get that? The whole whole, whole, whole joke about part and parcel of being in the big city? Yeah, except this one is with frickin' radiation. People in the area were thus somewhat familiar that being near such a facility could cause some problems, but this time was going to be very different. So what happened? Well, the short of it is that the cooling system of a cistern containing radioactive waste failed. And from that, nobody noticed that it actually failed. Over time, the waste of the facility started to heat up as there was nothing inside of it that could have cooled it down, and eventually, it would manage to explode at a temperature of 350 degrees Celsius. And when something like this explodes, that is an extremely powerful force. The 160-ton concrete cover that was on top of it that was supposed to contain everything burst open, flinging something along the lines of 20 million curies of radioactive material into the sky, where it was scattered by the wind. It would settle over an area around 20,000 square kilometers, inside of which was anywhere between 200,000 and 300,000 people all of which were now caught up in the stream. And at the time that this occurred, everyone knew that something had happened, but no one really understood the gravity of it, least of which were the people in the area until the government actually came in and did something, which ended up actually taking a while. A full week would manage to pass before the immediate affected zone's 10,000 residents in the immediate area would be evacuated. And of course, as I said earlier, because the plant was something that was surrounded in secrecy, no one was given any information about why it is that they had to leave. But by the time that any of this occurred, which, as I said, was a week later, reports started to occur of people suffering from mysterious ailments, such as the fact that their skin was quite literally falling off of them. Now, naturally speaking, when I am talking about the subject, the image that I'm going to be putting behind me here is something that is going to be very general. I can't obviously show the extremity of what people experienced. But I need you to understand this. People's skin was quite literally falling off of them. The entire thing was like rapid onset leprosy. But of course, when we're talking about a subject like this and people experienced as horrible of things as they did across as wide of an area as they did, it is naturally speaking going to be impossible to keep all of the information from escaping. 
at least, again, to the immediate area. The outside world didn't really understand or know about what had happened until significantly later. The Western world, though, really only began to hear about this in the year 1976, almost 20 years after the disaster actually occurred. That was when a Soviet emigrant by the name of Zoris Medvedev ended up revealing some of the details of the catastrophe so that people could begin to understand this. Do you want to know the really sick part, though? That was only when the public began to really hear about it. As it turns out, the CIA had actually known about this disaster for many years previously, as early as the year 1960. Because by the year 1960, its wide network of informants and aerial spy photos had already provided the CIA a very clear picture of what exactly had happened at the facility. These documents were later published internally, but they were never actually revealed to the public, and they weren't revealed for a very specific reason. They potentially didn't want to damage the image of the United States' own nuclear program. After all, we're talking about the late 50s and early 60s, a time period in which nuclear technology, and specifically energy, is becoming bigger and better, something that is becoming more widely accepted by the public, so why would they potentially try and harm that and damage public opinion? I don't think I'm capable of exaggerating the absurdity of all of this, because it's very funny when we're talking about things in history, but government laboratories even put out statements that were downplaying Medvedev's accounts of the seriousness of the Kishtim incident. I will repeat myself. The United States specifically downplayed a Soviet disaster within the Soviet Union. And so the CIA, instead of working against the Soviet Union, instead made Moscow very happy. It's easily one of the most absurd cases that one could probably think of. The CIA actually helped the Soviet Union over the course of the Cold War by downplaying this incident. The majority of the details about this entire thing wouldn't even come out really until the year 1989. I would call this entire thing a dumb event in history, but considering the amount of events that occur, that's just, that's not a fair statement to say with the sheer amount of stupidity that occurred from this. The next one up on this list that we're going to be talking about is the Windscale Incident, which is a very ironic thing considering that we just talked about the whole thing with Kishtim that occurred in the year 1957, because this one would also occur in the year 1957. Though it wouldn't be very much later that year, it would quite literally only be two weeks later that something like this would happen. Except this time, it wasn't going to be in the Soviet Union. It was going to be in the good old United Kingdom. You see, when we're talking about the immediate aftermath of World War II and the great powers that were left after the conflict, the British really just refused to look at the United States and the Soviet Union and how they were racing each other to become the greatest nuclear powers and not participate at least a little bit in the race themselves. To stay competitive. So, almost immediately as soon as the dust had settled, the British would go on to try and build their own atomic bombs soon after the war ended, and would build their own nuclear reactors in the village of Seascale in Cumberland rather quickly. But if you recall what I said about the Soviet Union in the previous episode, and what happens when you try to build a nuclear facility very quickly and catch up to the powers around you, then, typically speaking, some corners are going to be cut. And so very little attention was paid to the environment, or health, or what was going to happen with radioactive waste as this was just discharged into the Irish Sea from the very beginning. Now, I'm being critical here from the very beginning, but you also have to remember then the early days of nuclear waste management, both the Soviet Union and the United States were doing relatively similar things. Speed was more important than safety at this point. But in comparison to the United States and the Soviet Union, which at least had been doing this a little bit longer and were a little bit more familiar with the subject, Great Britain's officials really only had limited experience with this technology, especially concerning the enormous amount of heat that could be generated in the process. What they did not actually know about nuclear technology was the Wigner effect, something that happens when graphite is exposed to neutrons, and I'm not going to try and explain the science behind this, I am not a science person, and it's just going to end up with me trying to read off on a script and not know what the hell I'm actually talking about. But if I wanted to dumb this down as much as I possibly could, I would say that the Wigner effect is what happens when graphite is bombarded by neutrons. The graphite is there to slow down the free neutrons in order to enable nuclear fission to take place. But the graphite can then become dislocated and cause a very sudden release in energy. And when you are talking about nuclear energy, you know that a sudden release in energy can typically mean boom. So it was that on October 10th, not two weeks after the previous incident that we talked about in 1957, that workers were conducting standard maintenance at the facility and they noticed rising temperatures. After investigating further, they ended up discovering that the reactor's uranium-filled graphite core had caught fire, and so the plant operators then had to go and risk their lives to try and fight the flames with cooling fans, with carbon dioxide, with water, with anything they could to try and bring the temperature down. Eventually, by October 12th, they would manage to get things under control and the fire would 
would die out, but by that time, well, the accident had already taken place. And a radioactive cloud was now spreading across the entirety of the United Kingdom as well as Europe. Unlike before when we were talking about the incident that occurred at Kishtum, no evacuations would end up occurring because of the wind scale incident. However, in at least some form of safety measure, what would occur is that officials would prohibit the sale of milk from the affected area for around a month. And while we don't know the exact severity of the after effects of what would occur here, it's estimated by scientists today that somewhere around the lines of 200 or 250 different cases of cancer may have been caused by this directly, with who knows how many amounts announce indirectly. At the time that all this occurred, the British government really released only sketchy details of the accident and what happened, and in general, naturally, would try to minimize the incident as much as possible in the news so that people didn't think that it was as big of a deal. Of course, we do know that it was actually a big deal, and the contaminated windscale reactor was subsequently sealed up until the late 1980s when cleanup would finally occur. Yeah, over the course of this entire video, you're going to be learning that it doesn't really matter the nation, government cover-ups are always going to be occurring. The next Next one on this list that we're going to be talking about is the Three Mile Island incident, something that occurred on March 28th, 1979, and among everything that we've talked about here in the United States, this is easily the most infamous incident, even if, technically speaking, it's probably not the worst in terms of its immediate after effect. As you can probably guess from the name here in this case, the Three Mile Island incident took place at the Three Mile Island plant near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And at the time that all of this occurred, this was a brand new facility. It was state of the art in terms of its design, its efficiency, its affordability. Everything about it was wonderful and needed, especially during this time period in which there was an energy crisis going on. Remember all the oil issues that we were seeing over the course of the 1970s in the United States? Well, something like this with a nuclear power plant, that was going to solve all of the issues with powering our homes, that you wouldn't need oil. Or at least, I guess that was the idea of it. It, it made this facility an exceptionally valuable place that was needed. Or at least, that was the case in the public's eye until the accident would happen. The accident would begin around 4 a.m. on Wednesday, March 28, 1979, when the plant experienced a failure in the secondary non-nuclear section of the plant. We're not exactly sure which, it could have been a mechanical or an electrical failure, but something ended up preventing the main feed water pumps from sending water to the steam generators to remove the heat from the reactor core. And I think considering what it is that we have discussed here previously, you all know what ends up happening when you cannot remove heat from a nuclear power plant. Well, what ended up happening in a series of unfortunate events is that this caused the plant's turbine generator and then the reactor itself to automatically shut down. When this happened, immediately the pressure in the primary system then began to increase, and as part of a safety measure, in order to be able to control that pressure, the pilot-operated relief valve opened. But here's the problem. The thing that we were talking about here was located at the top of the pressurizer, and the valve should have closed when the pressure fell to proper levels, but it became stuck open. For the people that were working inside the power plant at the time, they didn't notice that anything was going on because the instruments in the control room were telling them, hey, everything is fine. The valve is closed. It's all good. And as a result of that, the plant staff was completely unaware that cooling water in the form of steam was pouring out of the stuck open valve. As alarms were ringing all over the facility and lights were flashing everywhere, the operators did not realize that the plant was actually experiencing a loss of coolant accident. They couldn't pinpoint exactly where the problem was happening. And you would think at that point that they should have other instruments that would be able to tell them precisely what is going on, you know, as a kind of backup, but really, no. The other instruments that they had oftentimes provided inadequate or misleading information about it all. As an example, during normal operations, the large pressure vessel that held the reactor core was always filled to the top with water. So there was no need for a water vessel instrument in order to show whether the water in the vessel actually covered the core. As a result of that, the plant staff just automatically assumed that as long as the instrument showed that the pressurizer water level was high enough, that oh yeah, the core is also properly covered in water. But that was not the case. And so completely unaware of the stuck open relief valve and also unable to tell if the core was actually covered with cooling water, the staff ended up undertaking a series of things that would uncover the core. No, seriously, this entire thing plays out like a series of unfortunate events just played out with a nuclear power plant. And I'm going to go ahead and read it off here so you all understand what it is that I am talking about. So the stuck valve ended up reducing primary system pressure so much that the reactor coolant pumps started to vibrate and as a result of that were turned off. So then the emergency cooling water that was being pumped into the primary system now threatened to fill up the pressurizer completely, which is not a good thing, mind you. That is not good at all. And so they had to cut back on the flow of water. 
But here's the problem. Without the reactor cooling pump circulating water, and with the primary system not having any emergency cooling water, the water level in the pressure vessel ended up dropping, and the core then overheated. These critical errors that the operators were making ended up turning the entire thing into a disaster, and by early morning, the core had heated to over 4,000 degrees. Which for anyone who doesn't understand the seriousness of it, that is only around 1,000 degrees below what would be a full meltdown. And so as radioactive steam began pouring out of the plant, word of the incident would be leaked to the outside world, and within days, radiation levels were elevated across four different counties. And so as a result of all of that happening, the governor of Pennsylvania at the time, Richard Thornburg, ended up ordering the evacuation of all pregnant women and small children from the area. They had to go. It was on March 31st that plant workers were then able to finally address the problems and ended the threat of a meltdown from occurring. Although no official deaths or injuries or anything like that were reported, there still has been an ongoing controversy about the level of radiation that was released from Three Mile Island and whether or not it led to increased cancer and infant mortality rates in the region. We just don't really have anything that proves it or says it definitively, even if it is a possibility. Arguably, the bigger consequence from all of this is that effectively this destroyed the American people's confidence in nuclear energy for decades. Like, I want you all to understand the scope of what it is that I am talking about here. America was the first country to ever develop nuclear energy, proper nuclear energy. For the longest time, it was the pioneer in the science, and the reason why this incident, even though it didn't necessarily cause any deaths that we know of, was so big, why it's so infamous, is because thanks to this incident, it effectively shelled any possible future from nuclear energy becoming the dominant energy source within the United States. If this one incident did not occur, we probably would see a very different United States today in comparison to what we have now. But really, in the end, the true irony of all of this is that another incident would also take place in the United States, one that was arguably significantly worse, and yet, it didn't receive nearly the same amount of coverage. What I'm talking about next now is the story of Church Rock. For context for anyone who does not know anything about what I am talking about here, in order to develop nuclear weapons, or even besides nuclear weapons, develop nuclear energy, you need a source of a radioactive material to actually utilize, and what most people are utilizing is uranium. Uranium is something that needs to be mined, and so the race to develop nuclear weapons led to the establishment of uranium mines throughout the entirety of the world and in the United States, particularly in places like a certain Navajo reservation. And so in the year 1968, the United Nuclear Corporation began to operate the country's largest underground uranium mine in the rural chapter of Church Rock, New Mexico. This mine was ridiculous big. It was something that was capable of producing around 2 million pounds of uranium oxide annually, and from it alone was estimated to fuel around 5 nuclear power plants. But even though this thing was so hugely important, the waste from the mine was contained only behind a simple earthen dam. It wasn't anything that was complex or properly done, to the point that it was recognized by both the state and federal agencies that, hey, this thing is not structurally sound, and they should not be using this. In fact, by the year 1977, large cracks had been found in the dam, but even though they had these signs that something was really going wrong, nothing was ever actually done about it. And so it was then, that in the year 1979, that the dam at the Church Rock Mill collapsed. This ended up releasing 1,100 tons of radioactive detrius along with 95 million gallons of wastewater into the Puerco River. Two nearby aquifers were affected and pollutants were transferred something on the lines of as far as 130 kilometers downstream. Water samples, soil samples, air samples, all of these were taken shortly after the incident and found elevated levels of radiation that all of this had increased significantly at the time. Although thankfully, the levels would begin to decline following rainfall that would occur that autumn. Still though, for the people that were actually there, this wasn't a good thing. Even if levels began to drop, the incident still happened in the first place and the contamination had spread. The livestock, as in like the sheep and goats that had consumed the tainted water, were found to have elevated levels of radiation in their tissue, meaning they weren't things that could actually be utilized at that point. The Puerco River, which before had been a significant source of drinking water for livestock, as well as an important center of recreation for the Navajo people, that whole thing was now defunct. You wouldn't actually be able to utilize any of it. The entire thing was now contaminated, or even parts that weren't, you couldn't necessarily take the risk. Individuals in the area had to specifically be warned to not utilize the contaminated water of the river, and as a result of that, the United Nuclear Corporation eventually would have to dig new wells for the people in the area. 
They would do this along with removing around 3,500 tons of contaminated sediments from the area, but the reality of the situation, even if it sounds like that is a lot, is that this was only around 1% of the affected area that had actually been taken care of here. One freaking percent. And then to make matters worse, later on that year, the governor of New Mexico would deny requests from the Navajo tribe to declare the entire region as a federal disaster area. They were all just completely ignored and didn't receive any of the federal funding or support that they should have after such a disaster would occur. But if you really then wanted to add insult to injury after all of this, less than five months after the spill occurred, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would then permit the United Nuclear Corporation to resume operations at the site. These activities Activities would only worsen the conditions of what was already going on, leading to more extensive groundwater contamination. Ultimately, the mine would finally be abandoned only three years later in the year 1982. But it was only after this would happen and the company had gone that in the year 1983 that the entire region would be placed on the Environmental Protection Agency's national priority list. Keep in mind, as I am talking about this incident, this is a disaster that released significantly more, perhaps three times more radiation than the previous incident that we talked about at Three Mile Island. But the difference between it is that this one didn't receive nearly the same level of coverage from media as the other one had occurred and didn't really have any kind of change on U.S. national policy. And as for why, well, the answer is probably a little bit obvious. This spill managed to contaminate the land and water that were used by members of the Navajo Nation. To the company and the country that was looking in on this, it didn't really matter as much as something that occurred in a developed part of Pennsylvania. State and national officials ended up downplaying the incident, which had primarily affected a location that was largely rural, sparsely populated, and was majority American Indian. As I talked about with the governor ignoring the request from the Navajo tribes, people just really didn't seem to care about what happened to him there. I know I've talked about this more in previous episodes and also on my podcast, but I will say it here once again. History is not clean. But as I just said, with history not being clean, naturally speaking, that means that when talking about nuclear accidents and disasters and fallout, we have to talk about the worst one of them all. Chernobyl. Honestly, when I'm talking about something like Chernobyl, I'm not really sure what it is that I could say that has not already been said by dozens of different figures on the internet already. I'm sure that many of you who are already watching this have probably already seen either some of those videos, are familiar with what Chernobyl is, or has seen some kind of television show or movie that depicts the events. There are plenty of everything here. But Chernobyl, to this day, is still regarded as the worst nuclear disaster in history. It is a facility that was built in the late 1970s, around 65 miles north of Kiev in Ukraine. And this this plant, by the time that the accident had actually occurred, was one of the oldest and largest nuclear power plants in the entire world. Or at least it was, until in April of 1986, some bungled experiment at one of the facilities for reactors would then lead to an utter disaster. And so I'm going to go ahead and kind of explain how all of this went down. It was on the 25th of April, 1986, that everything at Chernobyl was proceeding as normal. There wasn't really anything special about that day. Prior to a routine shutdown, the reactor crew at Chernobyl 4 began preparing for a test in order to determine how long term turbines would spin and supply power to the main circulating pumps following a loss of the main supply of electrical power. This test had been done something that had already occurred the previous year at Chernobyl. They had done this before, but the power from the turbine ended up running down far too quickly. So in order to help this, new voltage regulator designs were to be tested, except here it was not going to go well. A series of operator actions, including the disabling of automatic shutdown mechanisms, then preceded the attempted test early on the 26th of April. But by the time that the operator had moved to shut down the reactor, everything at that point was already in a very unstable position. But then it would only get worse because a peculiarity of the design of the control rods ended up causing a dramatic power surge as they were inserted into the reactor. The interaction from this of very hot fuel with cooling water then led to fuel fragmentation along with rapid steam production and an increase in pressure inside of the entire system. The way that it was designed, considering again that we're talking about something that was Soviet in technology, meant that substantial damage to even three or four of the fuel assemblies would and did result in the destruction of the entire reactor. As a result of the overpressure within the system, the 1,000 ton cover plate of the reactor became partially detached. This ruptured all the fuel channels, which then jammed all the control rods, which by that time were already halfway down. Steam began to be generated in massive Massive amounts around the entirety of the core, which in turn caused a steam explosion, releasing fission products into the atmosphere, contaminating the entire region. Only around two to three seconds later, a secondary explosion would also occur, throwing out fragments from the fuel channels as well as hot graphite. A lethal cloud of radioactive material would then gather over the nearby town of Pripyat, which, ironically enough, considering that we're talking about things with a 
Soviets once again, this is a town that would not be evacuated for a good 36 hours. Of course, the cloud would not stop there and would continue to waft across the entire region with the Soviet Union and then spreading out over the rest of Europe. In the opening days of the crisis, when we're talking about this, approximately 32 people would die at Chernobyl immediately, and then dozens more would end up suffering from radiation burns. The radiation that managed to escape into the atmosphere here was equivalent to several times that that was produced by the atomic bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And from this, millions of acres of farmland were subsequently contaminated. We still do not know, to this day, the exact human toll of this disaster. Experts believe at this time that thousands of people died immediately as a result of Chernobyl, or at least very quickly in the next couple years. And then subsequently, as many as 70,000 people afterwards may have suffered severe poisoning, but we don't really know. Ultimately, it was not until the year 2000 that the last working reactors at Chernobyl ended up being shut down, and the plant was then officially closed. And I suppose here at the end, there are still many more disasters that I could potentially talk about. We could talk about Fukushima in Japan. We could talk about any number of the potential nuclear disasters that possibly could have happened in the case of the ongoing war with Russia and Ukraine, ironically enough, at Chernobyl itself. But I don't think that that is very fitting to the picture here right now. The reason why we're talking about any of this is because of the movie Oppenheimer, something that has brought the idea of nuclear energy once again into the public's conscience. Obviously, from me talking about all the disasters that have occurred here, one might look at this video and get the impression that I am perhaps anti-nuclear energy, but that is not the case. The movie in general does not necessarily focus on the after effects of the use of the bomb. It does somewhat to a degree, but this is primarily focused on things in terms of geopolitics and less of the human cost of it. It's not there to make any kind of moral argument. Nuclear energy at this time was perhaps one of the greatest discoveries to ever occur within human history, but simultaneously as the movie presents it, it might have also then led to the destruction of the world. We've talked about, in this case, about all the contamination and things that have occurred, but what we have not talked about here is the previous incidents in which nuclear escalation could have occurred that ultimately would lead to the destruction of the world. I don't really know what else it is here that I could say in the end. Nuclear energy is really a wonderful thing with a potential that no other kind of source of energy has the ability to replicate. It just doesn't, not on the same scale. And as technology gets better over time, who knows? Maybe a video that I would be making 20 or 30 years from now would have a very different story on the outlook of it. Because while nuclear energy is a grand thing, and it does have the potential for greatness, simultaneously, it does have the potential for disaster. Because in comparison to any other source of energy, when something goes wrong with one of these plants... Well, the potential for disaster is as equal or not greater than the potential for greatness. And that's really all it is that I can say on that matter. But everyone, that is really all I have here to say at the end. This has been Stakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate all of you for watching, and I ask you to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you very much, and goodbye, guys.